Hi, today we've got some LED PCBs to solder up and these might look very familiar for those of you who have watched some of my early videos because quite a few months ago we investigated some LED boards and also uh, epoxy coating and adding glow in the dark pigment and that kind of thing to these. Um, but what I found is this was an FR4 PCB and if I wanted to run these LEDs at maximum current which is somewhere around 150 milliamps the thermal dissipation just wasn't good enough. Although I flooded as much of this PCB as possible with copper, we were getting very hot LEDs and pretty cool bits of PCB. So we weren't spreading that heat around. And obviously the epoxy was also not that helpful for thermal dissipation. So I redesigned the boards slightly uh, and we had these made at PCB way relatively inexpensively. So these are panels approximately 90 by 140 millimeters and we had 10 panels of each different size made. Um, we went for the highest thermal conductivity and that there are two different designs here. One that is one millimeter thick and one that's 1.6 millimeter thick um, in white with the black silk screen. Uh, there is another video I did quite a while back about investigating the type of PCB that you should use with LEDs for maximum efficiency and we did find that the white silk screen, um, sorry the solder mask really did help with the efficiency. When we used black we didn't get quite as much light out and the colours did affect the hue that we saw from the PCBs. So I've had 10 sets of each panel made and they came in at about $70 for the different design. And the reason we've got two different designs is because we've got some LED profiles here which have already been embedded into some oak shelves that I've got in the bathroom at the moment. So I routed those out and these are the offcuts from it. These are some really, really nice bits of aluminium profile. And if you're interested, I think I bought these at Ultra LEDs and they've got loads of different types of LED profile, uh, all different types of colours sizes and you can get corner profiles and that kind of thing and what's really nice is you can pick the diffuser material so you get the led channel and then you can pick whether you want an opal semi-clear or transparent diffuser and that can give uh, quite a different effect depending on the um, leds that you've got installed here the opal which is really quite uh, diffuse does have the side effect that it will absorb quite a bit of light. So you don't quite get as much light efficiency, but in a PCB like this, where we've got quite a high spacing between the LEDs, it may help get rid of those hot spots. But I think I ordered the opal and the semi-clear so that we could test between the two. But these are really, really nice LED profiles. And we've got the two different designs because they're slightly different in thickness, but also uh, the smaller profile won't accept a 1.6 millimeter PCB. So we've got the two different designs there. If you're interested, um, we've got to make four meters of the thin PCBs, which are the equivalent of three panels. And we've got to make about six panels of the thicker PCB. So that's what we're going to be assembling today. Total of 420 LEDs. And the LEDs that we're going to be using on these boards are these Cree JB2835 AWT LEDs. And these are some really nice LEDs that have a high color rendering index. So these are 90 uh, CRI, uh, color temperature of 3000 Kelvin, which matches the rest of the lighting in the room. And each LED has a forward voltage drop of around three volts. There are some other options. I think you can get some uh, with a forward voltage drop of nine volts or something like that. Um, but these are the 60 milliamp forward current type giving a total power dissipation of about 0.2 watts per LED chip. And here they are on DigiKey. When I bought them, which is quite a while back now, I think I paid about £8 for this pack of 1000. Uh, they've gone up slightly since then, but they're still really good value. And at 60 milliamps, you get around 22 to 24 lumens from each chip depending on the temperature of the LED die. But if you read the data sheet, you can actually run these LEDs all the way up to 150 milliamps, increasing the luminous flux by 220%. However, you do have to obviously be able to dissipate the extra heat of that power. And also we do start to see a slightly decreasing efficiency in the LEDs when we drive them at those higher currents. So these are going to be assembled onto the PCBs and you'll see we've also got space for LEDs and one thing that I did find with this design when I was testing it at those higher currents is these resistors do get quite hot and I quickly checked the maths 
Um, so I'm intending to run each of these LED strips from a nominal 24 volt supply. And that means that we would need three 10 ohm resistors each. Uh, adding up would dissipate um, 0 0.7 watts. Uh, sorry, all three of them together would um, dissipate 0 0.7 watts, giving a, an efficiency of 80% per LED board. Uh, but when you consider how many PCBs we're making, we're going to be making um, 70 PCBs each dissipating 0 0.7 watts just as heat in resistors. Um, we're talking about sort of 50 watts or something like that that would be just wasted in resistors. So what I've decided to do rather than fit those resistors like that is I'm just going to stick some 1 ohm resistors in each of the pads. That will reduce the dissipation uh, by quite a bit. We'll only have uh, 70 milliwatts or so for, per PCB, increasing the efficiency to 98% or so. Uh, but the idea is that either I will put a DC to DC in the control panel to run these from 19.8 volts and then do the PWM on top of that. So basically bringing the supply voltage down closer to what it is for the bare LEDs and that improves our efficiency in the first place. Um, but also I was thinking about the idea of having the driver PCBs some distance away from these LEDs. And I'm not sure it's a sensible idea to have our PWM frequency, you know, along a long length of cable with quite high currents through it. So either um, I might change this just for some constant current LED driver design uh, or bring the drivers uh, much closer to the PCBs. So the reason that I've added those one ohm resistors rather than just linking out the resistors altogether is because I do, if I do go with a constant current design, it's likely that all of these boards will be paralleled up together. And as you know, we do get some mismatch between different LEDs and some of the boards will end up receiving more current than others. So we do need some um, matching resistors on each of the boards. Now, three ohms in total is possibly a little bit excessive, but it will be absolutely fine. Gives a little bit more spo um, scope if we do end up going for a constant voltage DC to DC converter and then PWMing the output. To assemble these PCBs, we're going to be using this Chipquick solder paste. This is a lead-based 6337 eutectic mix. I actually ran out of Solder King paste and this was available next day from RS. So this is what I ordered. Uh, the part number's here for RS1466191. Relatively inexpensive and it comes in a tub which I much prefer because with the syringe, when you're assembling PCBs, if you end up with excess, you can't get it back in the syringe whereas you can just wipe it back into the tub and use it next time if you can keep it within its use-by date. So uh, we're going to be testing this one out today to see how it works with these boards. And also I'm going to be using my DIY SMD pickup tool which is what I use for all of my SMD assembly. And this is probably my most used tool in the lab apart from the soldering iron. And I often get asked in the comments what the tool is that I'm using. And I did a video where I assembled my own unit. I'll put the link up just here. But what I've decided is that was quite a unique design with a couple of expensive parts in it. And since I keep getting asked if I can um, share the design and where I've got all the parts from and everything like that, I've decided I'm going to redesign the main unit. So I've sourced some parts from AliExpress, which are much more affordable. And when they arrive, we'll start investigating a design that everyone can recreate, uh, a, a simpler design that's more useful. Uh, but when I looked at what was available on the market, there really isn't anything that's up to scratch. Even the unit from JBC uh, only comes with the type where you put your finger over it. It doesn't have uh, the three-way valve, which I think is essential for this type of tool. So uh, we're going to do that design in um, a couple of weeks, hopefully, if those parts arrive from China. So a quick test that we've been sent the right LEDs before I assemble all of these. And yeah, there we go. We get a nice warm white from each of these. So let's start assembling these up.
so we've got a bunch of these boards assembled up now. It didn't take too long in the end, about an hour and a half. And I ended up doing some spares so that we had some extra ones uh, in case we needed them. Now what I want to look at next is the diffuser material. So as I mentioned, we've got this channel and I've got two of the different types of diffuser. This one is the opal and this is the semi-transparent diffuser. And you can see there is quite a bit of a difference between the two. This one is extremely opaque. This one, um, you can kind of see behind it a little bit. You can see the LEDs there. Um, now, obviously this one being more opaque will diffuse the light a lot better. The downside being we lose quite a lot of light through this diffuser. So let's quickly um, try putting an LED strip into this little bit of channel here and see what the two diffusers look like. So this is the Opal diffuser at 60 milliamps, which is the nominal current for these LEDs. Let's turn it up to 150, which is the maximum. And there we go. And that's actually doing a really, really good job of diffusing the hotspots from these LEDs. Let's try the same with the translucent. So 60 milliamps once again. And that's 150 milliamps. And that really is significantly brighter. That makes a huge difference. So I've just measured the light output with the two types of diffuser with the Unity light meter at a distance of 250 millimeters. And we got 3066 lux from the semi-opaque diffuser at 150 milliamps, dropping down to about 1712 at 60 milliamps. But when we swap it out for the opaque, we see quite a drastic decrease in light. So uh, this is measurement error, I think, which is why we get a different answer for each of those. But we're losing about 40 to 45% of our light through this diffuser compared to this one. So significant energy loss. And by eye, this one looks absolutely fine. So I think this is the one that we're going to be fitting to these LED strips. So the final thing that I want to investigate today, because I can't um, assemble these into the LED strip without the LED tape um, to hold it in place, I just want to see what method works best for attaching these strips together because they are designed in such a way that the distances are maintained when you bridge the solder joint. So as you can see, if I put this one offset, the LED spacing is exactly the same, even though we've got this joint in the middle. So uh, I was kind of hoping that we might be able to do a solder bridge, but with the aluminium in between the two, um, there is the possibility that it's going to short out on that piece of aluminium. So we might just need to wire link these together. Now also, as you know, this is aluminium cord PCB. So we're going to be dissipating quite a bit of heat when we're trying to solder this. Um, so we'll probably use one of the bigger stations, probably the Metcal GT120, which is designed for these higher thermal profiles that need to be soldered. So first of all, we'll see if we can bridge across here with some solder. So that looks like it's done a pretty good job. In fact, the solder mask goes right up to the edge of these boards on this edge. So I don't think there's any chance of any solder wicking into where the aluminium is. So I think this might be quite viable. Let's test it to see if electrically it works. And yeah, that works quite nicely. So I've had these LEDs on for around 10 minutes now with 300 milliamps in total through these two segments. So 150 milliamps each. In total, this is getting on for around six watts. And you can definitely see the difference between the two types of diffuser. If I change the exposure a bit, uh, you can see on this side, this is the opal diffuser and this is the semi-translucent. And there's a lot more light getting through that one. And you can still see the hotspots quite easily. So it's not making a huge difference between those two types of diffuser. Now I'll peel back the diffusers and let's have a look at the thermal profile across here. So this is with uh, one of the Unity thermal cameras. And interestingly, uh, we can see we've got some voltage drop going on already, even though we've only got two segments here, because at this end, uh, we're getting about 46 
degrees C at the hottest point and at this end closer to around 43 or so so uh, we're definitely getting a little bit of voltage drop it's not you can't really see the difference by eye between these two uh, but on the longer pieces of aluminium profile I've actually put in sections where we can feed in additional power so that we don't just have a gradual drop in brightness it'll be fed from both ends and possibly in the middle so that's about as far as I can get today without the double-sided tape to stick these LED boards into the profile. Uh, but we've got this working quite nicely and we know we've got some really high quality LEDs, high quality PCBs installed into this aluminium profile and we shouldn't have any problems with this in the future. One of the problems that I've had with LED tapes in the past is you just don't know what you're getting. They say they use various brand of LEDs but you're never going to know. And what I've also found is the phosphor degrades really quite badly quite quickly. So we've got some uh, in the utility room which I tested um, before installing in the kitchen and I'm glad I didn't because after one year the warm white LEDs have basically gone yellow probably a quarter of the original brightness um, so you just don't know what you're getting so I know that with these Cree LEDs running them at a reasonable current we should get good long lifetime from these LED profiles. Now I did mention that my original plan was to run these from a 24 volt supply but looking at these dropper resistors we were wasting quite a lot of power so now I need to come up with a solution to drive the LEDs closer to 20 volts or so. So I was having a look at DIN rail supplies because I really don't want to have to rebuild a completely new uh, DC to DC converter design for probably about 120 watts of LED lighting. So I was having a look at these DIN rail converters but the 24 volt ones all have an adjustable voltage. There's a little pot on the front but it's 24 to 28 volts on this one, uh, 24 to 28 volts on this TDK Lambda and uh, pretty much the same thing on these 23.5 to 28 so a little bit more adjustable here but none of them go down to 20 volts so we might in the next video take one of these DIN rail power supplies apart and see if we can just modify it on the PCB because I imagine although some of these do have um, alarms for if the voltage has dropped I think I've got a fairly basic one we might just be able to adjust the feedback on this AC to DC converter and just get our 20 volts output and then I'll be able to drive these just with a PWM output from my LED control boards. So anyway I hope you enjoyed the video if you've got any thoughts or comments or if you've seen a decent 20 volt DIN rail supply uh, leave that in the comments down below. Don't forget to visit PCBWay if you want to make some LED boards like this and until next time thanks for watching.